Uh, we have church and service organizations that come to volunteer as well, not just for the meals, but also to put on events, bowling and barbecues. Um, National Charity League uh, does a monthly birthday. Every first Friday of the month they come and we celebrate whoever's having a birthday in the shelter that month. And it's really fabulous. They bring cake and balloons and gift cards and it's just a fabulous, fabulous event. Um, we have many, many different volunteers who put on a lots, of, lots of different events. We had one at the park, we barbecued, we played touch football, we did a lot of fun things. And most recently, the, um, one of our church's Pacific Crossroads came and took us all bowling. Uh, we all went bowling on a Friday or Saturday afternoon. And some of our residents hadn't bowled in years, but they were pretty good bowlers, I'll tell you. We had a very, very good time. So. Um, uh, the other volunteers are the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts that have gotten to know us, uh, several of the different troops that have gotten to know us, and they've put on bake sales and rummage sales on our behalf. Uh, they've painted our kitchen. They have given us cash money for our general fund. Um, and I'm going to digress just a tiny little bit because I want to tell you about our general fund real quick. We have that little pot of money that we use all the time to help our clients when they can't afford prescription drugs. We give them whatever money they need to supplement uh, to buy that those drugs. Uh, car maintenance. Some of them have cars that have very bald tires that need tune-ups that they can't even take their kids in because they're not safe. We're able to give them a little bit of money to help them with that. Um, ID cards. So many people come to our resident to our shelter that don't even have an ID card. They can't even say definitively who they are and they can't get services without an ID card so we give them the seven dollars because we hook up with an agency that charges seven dollars uh, to get those birth certificates for their children as well because they can't go into school without uh, evidence we give them gas cards we give them target cards or shopping uh, supermarket cards that's what our general fund is used for uh, and, and a myriad of other things but I'm just not going to take up all of your time telling you all of it but as far as our private citizens, we have people who have brought their talents and their skills to Path Achieve Glendale. We have two hairdressers that come to give haircuts to our residents when they're getting ready for an interview or they just need a haircut. They come and they do that. We have two general contractors that have come and done maintenance on our building for free of their own time using their own materials, finding them, buying them, whatever it is. Um, the Spot Gourmet, they did uh, catering for registry week. And by the way, um, the registry week that Steve spoke of, was manned all by volunteers as far as the food, as far as the venue. First Baptist Church gave us their facility to use for that entire week. And the volunteers themselves that went out at 5 a.m. To, to find the homeless and do the surveys. All volunteer driven. And if you don't think we're not proud of that, we really are. Because that was uh, droves of people who came to help us that week and it was a phenomenal week. Um, we have an attorney that comes and does con consulting with our residents when they have issues involving courts, etc. And um, tutors. Of course we have School on Wheels that comes and we have private tutors too that will come. And one of them came recently from um, the registry week when he got to know us and he said, you know, I'd love to tutor if anybody needs it. Well, we happen to have uh, a gentleman in our shelter who couldn't read or write. And he uh, took tutoring with him so that he could learn to read and write. And uh, this gentleman, just quickly, tell me when I'm running out of time, but this gentleman had learned to live by utilizing his hands, by becoming a skilled carpenter and cabinet maker and woodworker. And that's how he, he uh, complimented himself because he knew he couldn't do the other. So he, that was his trade, that was his uh, maintenance and things like that. And he also volunteered to do a lot of maintenance in our building too. So uh, we just get them from everywhere. We're just all over the place. Um, other volunteers have been uh, from the door program. Uh, they also help children, they're, they're nationwide, and they've come and, and what we established for them was to do scavenger hunts. They come once a month during the summer, they came four times this year, to do scavenger hunts. And they went out with a little script and a little direction to uh, try to get donations for us of furniture and household items for when our, our residents become housed, they don't have anything. So they came back with lots of great donations of kitchen items and dinnerware and household things and furniture, beds, sofas, couches, everything. It was phenomenal. It was all over our parking lot. But we got rid of them pretty quick because our, our, um, our residents need them. Um, um, 
And that's about all. I'm getting so distracted that I'm not even using my slides here, and I apologize, because I want to segue into our annual event that's coming up. This year it's called Breaking News. And there's a reason for that. It's because it's going to be held at the ABC Center, the communication center in Burbank. Uh, last year, Howie Mandel was there. We had over 400 people attend that event, and it was a very, very successful and lots of fun. It's coming up on September 10th. I'd like to uh, give you some invitations. Uh, I don't have them with me. I'm sorry, I forgot them. But if you'd like, I'd be happy to bring some over and uh, share them with you because it, it really is going to be lots of fun. We're going to have a live auction, live music, live updates, and wine tasting. So that should be great. Um, and that kind of wraps up my, uh, my little talk today. If you have any questions about volunteering or if any of you would ever like to come and volunteer, we would welcome you with open arms. I know Rodney has come with, with Nick and they've, they've uh, done uh, some events with us a couple of times uh, this year already, right Rodney? Fabulous, very well received and, and they do a really good talk. Uh, any questions? Ladies? No, I don't. I um, Iris has my business card that I'd like you to take with you. I'm in charge of community service projects for my Rotary Club. Okay. And I'm sure we can do either a guest chef or work together. So give me a call maybe next week. I shall do that. Thank you so much. And thank you all so much for the time that you've given us today. Mr. Kahn has a couple of comments. Mr. Kahn. Oh. Let, me, let me add a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, September 10th is our, our function. It's in the beautiful city of Glendale. ABC 7. Oh, is that in Burbank? I'm oh, sorry. It's in the beautiful city of Glendale. <laughs> I, I'm not from here, obviously. <laughs> I thought so. Glendale, not Burbank. Yeah, Glendale, not Burbank. I was going to send you yeah, off exactly. to Burbank. Um, the other thing, too, I think, which is great, and I think we've talked about in the past before, is we are coming up on a, a, a new building that we're looking at for our facilities, and that's part of the PATH Achieve. Um, we're moving on from PATH, as was mentioned, and we're coming up with our new name and unveiling, and that's what September 10th will show us. But in terms of the construction for the new business, I'm sorry, the new building, we've gone through plan check, we've gotten our permits, we're now uh, looking at selecting our general contractor, and we're hoping to get under construction so that by the beginning or first quarter of 2013, that whatever the new name is, currently it's PATH Achieve Glendale, will be moving into this new permanent facility. So it's something else to add to what is taking place out there, and we're very excited about that. Anyway, thank you thank guys you. for coming thank today, you. though. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And thank I, you. I understand that you're announcing your new name at your September 10th event. Correct. Is that correct? <laughs> correct. Just thought I'd we're all jumping at the bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. What is next, please? Item three, commission staff comments. I don't have any. I have none. Well, uh, staff? Gary, now's your chance. <laughs> okay, if no comments, and then Gary. what is next? Item four, oral communications. I don't have any cards. Nor do I. Item 5, Consent Items 5A, Approval of the Minutes of the Commission Regular Meeting held on July 18, 2011. Okay, may we have a motion, please? Commissioner Patrick is ready there. Still moved. <laughs> is there a second? I'll second it. Can we have roll call, please? Sure. Commissioner Scarpetian, absent. Khan? I'll abstain. I was absent. Patrick? Yes. Sharkey? Yes. President Rotfogel? Yes. Item 6, Business Agenda, 6A Action Item. 6A1, Motion to Note and File a Report Regarding the Granting of a Permit to Glendale Flyers Club for the Use of Freeway Site 8 Airfield. I'll present Coco Pinocin up here for the report for the Flyers. Thank you, President Ralph Fogel, members of the Commission. My name is Coco Panosian. I'm an Administrative Analyst for the Park Services Division, and I am here to talk to you about the Glenda Flyers and the uh, permit we're working on issuing them for the uh, use of the Freeway Side A airfield. Um, the uh, Glenda Flyers are a local uh, residence group that they are a model airplane enthusiasts. These people get together as a club. Uh, they're based out of the Sepulveda Dam. They actually are a subsidy of the uh, 
San Fernando Valley RC Flyers, RC meaning radio control. And they approached us last year, they wanted us to reopen the airfield. Now some of you may remember the airfield we used to have, what we call the airfield, was at Freeway Side A. And I have a brief presentation to show you and the folks at home an aerial of the location we're specifically talking about so you have a better understanding, get a picture of what we are planning to do. I'm assuming this thing works? This uh, picture right now you're looking at is an aerial picture of uh, freeway site A and as you see where it's noted A on the photo it actually isn't the location. That A is a sports complex. We had to base it off of an address to pull the aerial. The sports complex where it's pointed A you see the three ball field. Just north of that there is an open space area. Oh, right there, this works. This is the freeway side A, literally adjacent next to the, um, I believe it's the west, just east of the uh, freeway 2, north freeway. This area is a closer version of the actual property in the airfield we're talking about. As you see noted in the, uh, the black outing, that is the property we're talking about. Uh, that we are going to be using as part of this permit process. And then the airfield highlighted in blue, this is the area where they're going to be setting, uh, doing all the setup and the, the, the runway and the airplanes will be flying in this particular, out of this particular area. Now I want to give you a ground level picture. The picture on the, picture on the top here, uh, this is the entrance driveway moving up. So this is facing southward from the back of the airfield area. And the picture at the bottom, obviously just the opposite. This is going north uh, to the airfield through the driveway is a uh, nice picture of that. Now, what's happened over the years, and give you a little brief history on the existing club that was here several years ago. Uh, we ended up running into certain issues, maintenance issues, um, management of the site issues with the former group. And there were bottles of open alcoholic containers, and we're not quite sure if it was them or another group yet. They have the ultimate responsibility of the site because they're permitted to use the site solely. There's responsibilities of locking the gate and manning the facility, maintenance. None of that was going on. They didn't even have a restroom at the site. so. We don't want them to be impacting the sports complex where they're always busy and you know, full of you know, children using the site. So we came up with certain restrictions. Uh, we evoked the permit back in 2006, revoked the permit. And then we came up with certain conditions working with the fire department as to something they, ha they would have to do. One of them being portable restroom has to be on site, the site maintenance has to be part of the agreement, and when they're able to fly, uh, management of the site, insurance they must maintain, as well as their uh, membership uh, with the AMA, the uh, aeronautical model in, wait, yeah, Academy of Model Aeronautics, AMA. That's the uh, nationwide, nationwide uh, group of flyers uh, that are members with this. And the AMA is the one who ensures these clubs nationwide. And uh, including the insurance, of course. Some of the conditions they're able to meet, yet they weren't able to meet all of the demands. So their permit was never reinstated. And the field has been without any use for quite some time. Um, this is a result of not, nobody being at the site and maintaining. This is part of the open space as you know it. Uh, we don't go out and manage it as well as we're able to given the lack of personnel. So some of the mess that you see down here is a result of the cleanup at the area, yet some of it is just people, they found an area, there's trash, they just dump more. So the benefit of having this group there is, is more than uh, twice fold. One is the site will be used for a good purpose. Second, their presence at the site is going to uh, prevent this from happening in the future. And of course, the group that came to us, they have plans for holding some recreational opportunities for kids. They want to teach kids how to fly planes. They want to hold events at the site, competitive events. So it was a very attractive presentation from them. So we went along and started drafting a permit along with the city attorney's office. Now, uh, what I want to show you is a possible layout of the airfield. Of course, I kind of concocted this myself, but meeting with the gentleman on the site, have a general idea, this is how we may look like. This area up in the north that you see, it is a flatland area. By the way, all the shrub, the brush in here will be cleaned up. They are, once they get granted the permit, they will get on site, clean out all the brush, and have the airfield very marketable and be able to be used. That area is going to be used for a helicopter uh, area. They call it the helipad. Uh, the areas in the black right here, we're looking at possible parking areas, which if needed, we are looking at additional locations on site as we need to modify to work with the group. Hard to see, but this area right here I have in yellow also. This is the area where they're going to be doing the staging and the setup, where the groups will come in and drop off their equipment and the airplanes, put them together. 
uh, really hard to see now. I'm looking at this. Should have been a little darker. There are two runways I kind of drafted. This is what they'll use to get the airplane to the runway, and that'll be the runway to fly straight up. And the property boundary would be this black line right down here. They are not allowed to get on the other side of the property, um, well, at least not underground. This is another possible. This is another ground picture. This is the area right here, as you would see. This is the runway area, and of course, right now it is just dirt, and you have weeds growing all over the place. Once they get it cleaned up, it'll be more or less a straightaway runway for them to use. And then this area right here is the helipad area. This is uh, looking towards the uh, freeway, the two freeway from the side. And to give you a general idea where they're allowed to fly, the area circled by blue here is within the mountainous region that kind of encompasses the whole area, Site A. This is the only area that they are going to be allowed to fly. We don't want them flying over the freeway onto the residential area. We don't want them to be impacting uh, the sports complex operations. And you know, once you get beyond this point, it's hard to see the aircraft anyway because it's on the other side of the hill. So they understand that and they actually have certain restrictions that are far beyond our restrictions that they have to abide by to be nation national recognized by the AMA. What's the white building? The uh, white there building? is a reservoir right down here, um, part of the GWP uh, reservoir tanks. They have a tank up there. And further up north, right about this area, there is also the police shooting range that's not depicted here. Of course, they know very well not to encroach on any of these properties. Uh, there's certain uh, restriction we put, 200 feet, that they won't be flying low anyway from any of these properties that you see on site. Now, to give you an idea of some of the events that they hold at the Sepulveda area, the Sepulveda site is a lot bigger. Uh, I'll give you that. It, it's a lot larger area. They have a lot more organized. They have permanent uh, construction done at the site, which we are not anticipating at our site, given that it is the agreement initially is for five years, and we know possibility of that site being renovated for potentially, let's say, soccer fields in the future. We know we don't have the funding now. There is possible plans in the future. The group understands that, and they understand that you know, any time we are close to needing the site for use by the city, they will be vacating. So I don't see any permanent construction being done in the near future, yet it could always be a possibility as we move forward. Uh, I can't quite tell you what the events were. They shared some pictures, but they do hold competitive events. They have college engineers and students that come in. They build their own model planes and they fly them at the site. And uh, they, they hold a lot of events for kids. They teach them what the uh, airplane is all about, how it flies. They actually do simultaneous simulation flight, and they teach them literally hands-on to fly afterwards. Uh, I wanted to put the picture up north because there are a lot of questions about these planes. Oh, what happens if they crash? What about fire? We know it's a very high fire danger zone. Uh, it's the open space. There's a lot of shrubbery that have grown. The type of fuel that these engineers are using, or the pilots, the enthusiasts are using, are non-combustible. I mean, they do have some um, battery-powered airplanes, but they do also have some fuel power, but they're alcohol-based. And the gentleman assures me that he will do a test, he'll just throw a match into a bucket of the fuel that they use, he will not combust. So they give us their sureness that it won't be. We are working with the fire department, the fire marshal is reviewing the agreement. If he has any concerns or comments, we definitely will incorporate, and um, we do not want to, you know, make sure fire department has their say, obviously. We'll go along with that. But here is apparently an example of one of their planes that crashed, and all they have to just pick up the parts and move forward. I feel sorry for that group because it was part of the competition. I don't think they, I, I, for some reason, I don't think they won. Yeah. Uh, this is a sample, this down here is a sample of what you could anticipate as part of the helicopters. My wife won't even buy me, let me buy those little tiny helicopters that they sell at the mall and probably going to want one of these after they get on the site. And here's how they teach the kids. You see right down here, there's a gentleman who controls has a separate control, just like getting a, learning how to drive. You have the instructor next to you has your own steering wheel that can control the vehicle, so obviously not to crash it or um, do any damage. And this young girl who's trying to learn how to play. And as they get better at it, uh, let them allow them to control it on their own. And ultimately, you know, possibly future pilots that may be in the area as well. Um, the group is really excited about getting on the site. They're really just waiting for their blessing from, your, from you and from the department to get the agreement executed. They want to get on site, do the cleanup. They have raised some funds that they will be using to do the cleanup. Uh, they are not going to be relying on us for any of the uh, financial support for the cleanup and or the operation of the site. Uh, they do have 350 members, of which 70 are Glendale residents. Um, 
They're just waiting for their thumbs up to uh, get on site and start cleaning. They've notified me and we've said once they get the place ready to go, we are going to be in touch with our recreation folks to find youth that might be benefiting from this event. So they are looking for contact for different youth groups in the community that they can bring on site and be able to use. Of course, we do have some restrictions. They're not allowed to have any open flames, open containers. Restroom is a must. Uh, maintain weekly that there is no ins and buts about it. The restroom must be a portable restroom on site at all times. Um, the locking and maintenance of the site is their responsibility. We will monitor them just to make sure they are complying. Um, insurance and AMA membership is a must that they must always have. Uh, the agreement, the draft agreement we attach is pretty much 99% full agreement ready to be executed. It has the restrictions and the use conditions listed on page two and three. If you have any questions that you would like to uh, ask, I'll be happy to address. The other things they had requested of us is when they do their events, they do barbecues. Now, there's certain discomfort about having barbecue at the site. And we told them when the day comes, you want to hold an event. Let us know ahead of time. It has to be per department approval, written approval for you to be able to hold events. And we figured uh, with, with Gary met on site and we figured if they have the uh, the barbecue, uh, propane barbecue in you know certain safety pad areas, I doesn't think that it's going to be much of an issue yet. We want to make sure they don't just go on and do it on the site. We put all that in language in the agreement so that uh, you know they follow follow guidelines. They're very well aware of the restrictions. They were very well aware before they came to us and they're ready to comply. Great. Any questions? Some questions. Go. The uh, hours of operation? The hours of operation uh, typically is dawn till dusk. They would like... Yeah, it is dawn till dusk, not the other way around. They do like to fly at nights as well. I mean, they have the capabilities that their planes are... Uh, aircraft, I should call them. They do have all the lighting system, and they actually some of them claim they enjoy flying at, at night a lot more. We try to restrict that to start off with. We want to see how it plays out. Kind of a, a temporary get on site, let's do this probation, see how it plays out. And if they want to request the time extensions to be able to fly at nights, then we will consider it again by written approval by the director. We will consider giving them the permission. The concern, obviously, that site, as you can see, it's not developed, doesn't have any lights. Uh, but they do have generators, and you know we were on site when they brought a sample of a generator. It is so quiet we can stand next to it and not hear it. A couple of those generators will probably give them enough lighting to hold their event. Yet we're going to consider those down the road as you know the event comes and as they propose to us to hold an event. But it is dawn, uh, dusk till dawn till dusk. I get those two confused all the time. So, so the hours of operation are what? It, what is dawn? When the sun comes. Six thirty-seven. Would they need to operate their planes that They don't early? need to operate. Now, it's not necessarily that they have to be there at that time. They have the capability, they are permitted to be on site at that time if they so choose. If, you know, as a retired gentleman wants to go fly early in the morning when it's cool before the sun hits them, we, per agreement, we are going to allow them to be on site as early as dawn to be able to. Uh, and the, the noise that's generated from these planes or? We put a restriction on the noise. I believe we set 60 decibels at about 20 feet. That's somewhat of a standard, apparently, in the, in the uh, industry. Uh, they're not noisy. The, the residents near the area should not be hearing the uh, planes as they are flying. Given that they're flying more east of the actual runway in the property area, alongside the hill, just around the circle that we have shall point in the, air, the airfield, uh, it shouldn't have an impact. See, I have a concern. My concern would be... Uh First of all, the people, if, if dawn is 6 a.m. or somewhere near there, and then people are driving there, and then people are getting out, and people are setting up, and then starting to fly, if it's noisy, it shouldn't have an impact, but it may. And these are, these are, these are engines that make noise. I don't, I don't know why people have to start flying at 6 a.m. I, I just didn't understand that. Yeah. Well... Across, she just wanted to point. Gabrielle just wanted to point out the 7 a.m. is when the actual complex does open. That's similar to all of our parks. Mm -hmm. Any of our parks and open space areas that we manage right now are currently open. Literally, it's supposed to be by six, seven o'clock. We get everything open, so the public does have the right to use the sites. If you want, if they want to hike, let's say at the site, they are able to at seven. In terms of residents being impacted, anytime you obviously open up a new program or something, there will always be somewhat of an impact in the area. Yet the nearest residential property is of certain distance that 
Hopefully, you're right, there's a possibility that there may be uh, some impact. We, we don't believe that it will be. Uh, and they don't have to start at dusk. If commission feels more comfortable saying, no, I, I want it to start no, no earlier than 8, we'll definitely take that back to their groups, say this is commission's recommendations, they don't want you to start early. It is up to you folks if you want to change the timeline. In terms of impact to the community, we don't see it as a great impact, and if there is any impact to the community, we get complaints from the residents, definitely we'll revisit the agreement and say we need to amend it and uh, change the timeline because there's an impact to the community. The other question I had related to your comment about uh, if we were to use that, that area for future soccer fields or whatnot, is the lease, um, has it been drafted in such a way that whether it's in two years from now or 24, uh, you know, three years from now, is it the whole five-year term that they're, they're, they're able to use it for, or are we able to get out in 30 days from now? Either party, we drafted the agreement to address, either party is able to terminate the agreement for whatever cause you feel within with a 30-day written notice. I believe it is 30 days, not 60. Yeah, it says 30. Yeah, 30 days written notice. So since they are aware, we want to make sure we plug it into the agreement. Hey, look, if we come to you and say you need to vacate, be ready to vacate within 30 days. And of course, if we know ahead of time we got something coming, we want to give them a little more than 30-day notice. But Yes, we, we made sure we plugged that into the agreement. Thank you. I, I did read the contract, and it, it's very well covered with Thank it. You. And I have been up there, and it's, it's really isolated there. It and is. And I think the fire danger will be way less because it's, there's a lot of debris up there. I, I'm delighted it's going to be used, used for something. And also, they were there before. Um, what was it, five years ago or something? I used to see yeah. the planes and... And that was the chance for the residents. There weren't any complaints there. I can't see massive traffic going up, um, up to the park. Uh, so um, I, it's, it's, I think it's be a, an improvement. Yeah. And if so, I may add, I mean, it's a nice group of people. If I may add, they don't anticipate the heavy traffic yeah, to be I going to the side as well. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why the uh, the time frame we gave them, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, as a wide range that different members, based on their working schedules, are able to go at any given time within those restricted time frames and be able to fly. So that way it doesn't impact the whole area. Now, obviously, they're still responsible for the management of the site, the locking or unlocking of the gate, and the site is used by all departments not generally the actual property, but freeway side A is accessed by PD. As you know, they have the, the police shooting range up north, UWP, public works, just uh, just east of that area is where sometimes they bring in the debris base and the dirt and they dump there and they compact it. So it is used by multiple departments. We also have the cell towers, as you know, part of our revenue. We have four cell towers and their equipment stationed right in that area, south of it along the, the roadway. Now, they're not able to fly anywhere near, so they don't have any controls, any frequency changes or whatnot. But in terms of actual access to this site, there's more groups that are able to use it literally at that time. Mm -hmm. And in terms of cell towers, they actually the contract stipulates they can use it 24 hours if they have any emergencies or repairs or maintenance. Commissioner Patrick. I, I just have a, a couple of questions. Now, I, I'm... I, I did read the report, but I'm still a little confused. Sure. Is this the same group that was using this site before, or is this a different group? This is a different group. Although some of the members may end up being dual memberships, because a lot of these enthusiasts, they want to be as part of as many yeah. clubs as possible. Some of the members very well be the older group that we had on site. But we were approached by a different group, the San Fernando Valley Club, flyers, radio control flyers, and they wanted to create a subset and a subgroup, which is the Glendale radio control flyers, which is who we are looking at getting into agreement with. Yes, it's a different group. Okay, so this group has, has obviously proved themselves at the Sepulveda site that they can handle absolutely. and follow all of the rules and regulations. That uh, absolutely. Them. And, and I actually visited this site when they first came to us. Uh, former director George asked me to go to their site, meet some of their membership, and see what they were able to do. And in terms of the organization that I noticed at that site compared to what we had, with no disrespect to anybody, was, there was no comparison. Mm -hmm. So this is a very well-organized group, yes, and we expect a lot of good things from this group on this site. Thank you. And just a couple of quick questions. One, on the permit fee, I noticed the flat $250. Was there any thought to having the ability to increase it um, annually if we found out that there was some other, you know, some expenses to us or anything like that? 
We will definitely revisit that. If we've noticed that there is an impact to us financially, we obviously, per agreement, were able to visit that and address it again. Initially, we started with $100. That was the agreement with the former group. $100 for the permit. Given that it's a permit, not necessarily a lease, and there is mutual benefit by having them be at the site, we figured just administrative costs to cover the permit should do it. And given how administrative costs might have gone up recently, and you know, we noticed we're putting a little more time and effort into some of these agreements, at least initially, uh, the renewal of the agreement is fairly simple. They provide the insurance documentation, and we know the site is being operated properly. It's just getting that approved, and we're good to go, along with the 250 check. So if we notice that there is impact financially to the department, we'll definitely revisit the $250. But at this time, we felt 250 is reasonable. Okay. And this is a nonprofit group. Uh, you know, their dollars they get is from the membership dues that they collect, and when they hold the events, there is an expense that they will take on themselves. So... We figured it'd be fair. Okay. And the only reason I asked is I didn't, when I read it, I didn't see anything in there that said we could increase it. So. And you're absolutely right. I don't think we have that language in the agreement that says we can increase it. Uh, but given that the agreement itself is for a five-year period and we're, anytime I've been dealing with leases, anytime you want to visit the agreements, you have the ability have the to visit the agreement. Anyways, we have so. the 30-day clause. We tell them, hey, this cost is costing us more than we anticipated. We need to visit this and you know, address the fee issue. Okay. And I think the group will be ready to work with us at that point. And is there any kind of deposit that we would require in case um, we find that the restroom isn't being maintained or the, the area isn't being maintained? You know, we... We don't want to end up with a situation like we did with the previous uh, lease lease or permit holders. The, the, given that the restroom, uh, getting the restroom to the site is solely their responsibility, and the uh, covering the cost of the restroom is solely their responsibility. Physically, we are out of the game. Now, if they don't comply with that or keep the site clean as they're supposed to be, then they are not complying with the restrictions of the permit. Then we revoke the permit. We did run into trouble last time. You make a good point. We ran into the trouble when we asked the group to vacate. They left a lot of their junk behind, and they vacated. So there is that potential. I, I don't see it with this group. Yet there's always that possibility, of course, uh, that we might end up eventually taking a little bit of the burden on this. Okay. And then this two last things real quick. On uh, the restrictions, re the first restriction is consume an alcoholic beverage. I think that word, any, any, I think that any, word needs to be any. Yeah, you got it. And make I it a plural, so. any alcoholic beverages. Correct. And Gary, you're happy with this? Uh, yes, I am. I met with the, with the people. They're very well organized. They're extremely well organized, as a matter of fact. Uh, I was quite impressed. Uh, they brought the generators out to show us. They started them up for us. They did all that kind of work. And uh, the generators are actually quieter than... And it relieves some workload off of you maintaining the site? I don't have, I, yeah, that, okay. that was part of the deal. They don't have, I don't have to do anything. All right. President? Yes. Um, it's, it is critical that the department, especially in this environment, does not incur any um, additional costs or unforeseen costs. If we find that um, we're having to perform more management and oversight responsibility than, than we anticipate, then we will either uh, terminate the, le the agreement, change the agreement, or, or make sure that um, we're able to cover those costs or they're able to pay for additional costs or, or we, just, we just don't do it. And, and President Ralph Fogel, I mean, the group has raised already $10,000 to get this kick off, to get the cleanup set. And uh, it, as much as excitement there is in this group for using of the site, I mean, at least in good faith, I believe they will maintain it as per agreement. I'm sure they do they have will. funds set aside for this, and if need be, they can go to the San Fernando Valley, their father club, and, uh, you know, request a little funds to make, things, make ends meet. Yeah, Mr. Pre President. For example, one thing I'd like us to look at, again, is the um, hours of operation and if they're going to open before 7 or at 7. For example, if the park is, needs to be opened and closed and there's an additional cost to open it earlier to allow for them, that that's, then that's an additional cost. We have to look at those, those things. Yeah, and at this time, uh, we are looking at they will have access to the site given the permit. They will have their own one of their locks, just like there's probably about 20 different locks interlocked in that gate entrance. They will have access themselves. So it will not be required of us to 
go to the site, unlock the gates, and give them access. They're so responsible on their own, and even locking that site. Um, again, we don't anticipate that being a cost. Don't they need to have access to the sports complex to get to that park? No, sir. No? Okay. The, uh, I wish I had an aerial that kind of depicted that better. The sports complex entrance gates, as you're driving up Fern Lane, it leads directly into the sports complex, as you note. Uh, there are gates there. This is on the left. Before okay. you get access right. to the sports complex, mean. yeah, the gates that lead to the freeway side A. Great. Okay. And he'll do brush clearance. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe great. we should tell yeah. them they need to clear the brush farther outside of their area. <laughs> Not really. Um, any other comments? I have comments. No questions. Thank you. Sure. Um, in, in terms of uh, the hours, I would feel more comfortable having a, a time like 7 a.m. as opposed to just saying dawn. I think 7 a.m. is is early enough um, for people who want to use it and get out there in the morning as opposed to any later time or earlier time. The second thing too, and, and maybe maybe it's not necessary, but at least put it out for discussion is, is to have some language in this document, and it could be very generic, that does talk about if there is a, a cost increase to the city, that that it's it's funded for or addressed as opposed to just leaving it vague and out there to me they should know going in that if it's not already there that there is language uh, oriented to that those are my two comments and president Ralph Fogel, given that this is still in its uh, draft form uh, commissioner Khan, we definitely will go back to the group say we are making the amendment to plug in 7 a.m. until Dusk, oh, I'm guessing, at least. What, are the, what times are, well, I guess there's parks that are open later than du uh, Correct. dusk. Correct. But the earliest any park opens is 7 a.m. 7 a.m. No, it's not. The, the, the earliest any park is open is at 6 a.m. Which park is that? Almost all of them. It says in the charter of the city of Glendale that they're 6 a.m., and I was under the impression there were 7 a.m. also. For 29 years, I was under that impression. And I found out that it's actually 6 a.m. We do not have to be the we do not have to have the restrooms open for at 7 at 6 a.m. because we can't. But the rest the park can be open at, at 6 a.m. and and is to be open. Per charter. That's per ordinance charter. I'm forget exactly. It's in the it's in the language. And if I may add to uh, Mr. Morello's comment here, we've been contemplating this one, what to do with some of our parks, the opening and the times, and he is absolutely correct. 6 a.m. is when the public does have granted the right per charter to be at any property. The way we translate that to some degree is that they're not trespassing at that point if they are in a park. Some of our parks are gated and locked, and we try to accommodate 6 a.m., but very likely our staff, most of them start 6.30. By 7, we open. I think our park rules and regulations stipulate 7 a.m., the park, restrooms and stuff, should be open, we'll probably, we meet that guideline. But before 6 a.m., if anybody's in any park, then they are actually literally trespassing onto the park. The 6 a.m. charter rule is if a public wants to walk within the park, they definitely have the right to. We go by the 7 a.m. more or less, uh, just to give us the time to be able to get the parks open. I, I go back to, though, I'd still 7 a.m., because, you know, you're, you're thinking about it. I, I'm looking at it from this perspective. You can go on, you may be able to go onto a park at whatever time. The likelihood is you're probably not making as much noise. And if I looked at something like our noise ordinance, typically it doesn't want, it's 7 a.m. You don't start construction before 7 a.m. You don't make a lot of noise because it could have an impact on it. So it just, you can disagree with me, you can agree with me, whatever. It's just 7 a.m. to me sounds like a good start time. Joanne? Uh, President Rob Fogel and commissioners, uh, there's there's just an uh, there's not really an agreement, but we just had a consideration for the residents on Fern Lane. We open the sports complex at 7 a.m. And I, I would agree that seven sounds seven. like a reasonable time. And I think on the on the other end, dusk changes time so much it does. that dusk is is fine at the other end rather than putting a one person's dusk on, might be yeah you know <laughs> well the winter season as you know it gets dark by four thirty five o'clock it it is dusk and yet nowadays summertime dusk can be eight thirty do we do we want to for those people that do like to fly at night want to say you know, that they can fly in the winter until 7 o'clock? I mean, I don't think that that's not going to keep people awake, but, you know, we could say something like um, t 
until dusk or 7, 7 p.m., whichever is later. And then that gives them, you know, a little bit. I mean, it's up to, to you and what you think. But I think that, you know, 7 a.m. or 7 p.m. is not unreasonable. I don't, I don't have a problem with it going to 7 p.m. at all. I'm more interested in the morning right, I hours understand. Than, yeah. than I am so much the evening hours. So, if yeah. it will please the Commission, based on our experience and the talks we've had, we would prefer to keep it at dusk for the time being and allow them to request extension for their events. Concern is, again, logistics of okay. being on site after it gets dark. Uh, again, there are no lights at the site at all. We have to rely on some of their um, generators and providing their own light for the event. So if they are going to hold an event, you know, a couple of times a year that goes beyond dusk. I think we are open to that based per uh, director's approval. We want to make sure those events are approved for beforehand and not allow them to be on site at any given time. Okay. I mean, and we now, prefer that option at the moment. All right. And will their events, their, their special events, require special, a special permit and have uh, associated fees? along with those, or is that in the $250? Fees? No. There are no associated fees that we have come up with, given that, again, if they hold an event for the public, they're forking the cost of the whole event. It will be per by permit, though. The director has to approve the uh, event so that they can hold it beyond certain hours. But in terms of the actual cost for them to hold that event, they already have a permit for the site. We didn't think it feasible for us to say, no, you have to pay additional. They're solely responsible for all the setup for the event, the logistics, the cost of the food, drinks, and the cleanup. And so since we have no cost associated with that event they're going to hold, we felt it okay, reasonable. Okay, so if to staff is needed, they would also pay for that? Absolutely. I don't, all right. I don't that, correct. That's good. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? Motion? Oh, uh, comment? Mr. President, do you want us to revise the agreement to stipulate that they'll start at 7 o'clock? 7 a.m.? 7 a.m. I, I think so. <laughs> I'm fine. And I, I will also, uh, Commissioner Khan, take your recommendation and include, I'll work with the City Attorney's Office to include cost reallocation if there is a cost to us, additional cost. Yeah. I think it's a fair, very good point. We'll plug that into the agreement so they know very well if we incur a cost that we're going to pass it right on to them. And I do believe they will agree to that as well. I agree. So is there a motion as, with the amendments to accept and note and file? Okay, so... Yes. The motion is to note and file, and we will incorporate the feedback that we received today on, on those two items. Okay. Did you want to read that? You looked like you were ready. Is there, okay, is there, is, there, is there a motion? I'll make a, I'll make a motion to note and file. Dottie, is there a second? It's a second. Thank you. Thanks. Roll we'll call, call, please. Commissioners, Garpetian is absent. Khan? Yes. Patrick? Yes. Sharkey? Yes. President Rotfogel? Yes. Item 682, motion providing direction to staff on expanding the existing community services and parks banner policy to include all ball fields, multipurpose fields within the city. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Good afternoon, President Rotfogel, members of the commission. I'm Gabrielle Golia, the community services supervisor in the sports section. Um, on October 18th of this past year, we came to you um, and you adopted a policy regarding the rental of fence space for advertisements at the sports complex and the Verdugo Skate Park. Um, under this existing policy, uh, we allow the, the softball fields, the soccer fields, and the fencing area around the skate park to be rented out um, for a set fee. Um, for local Glendale businesses, it's $100 per month for them to put up a banner. Um, Non-local Glendale businesses is $200 a month. Non-profit advertising is $50 a month. And rental space from approved community youth groups who obtain their own sponsorships and advertising banners was 25% of their uh, the amount that they are raising. Um, and also under this policy, if a group wanted to put up a banner during their rental period and put it up for the day and take it down at the end of the day, there was no fee associated with that. Um, to date, we've had one group rent out the skate park, uh, or rent space on the skate park fence for a banner, and we generated $300. Um, 
Mostly we feel that the reason we haven't gotten more is that we don't have a staff person dedicated to go out and solicit banners. Um, so if businesses come to us and ask to put up banners, then we can rent to them under this policy, but we just don't have anyone to go out and try and fundraise for it. Um, we are recommending that the existing policy be expanded to include all ball fields and multi-purpose fields. Um, and there's a few amendments to the policy that we're recommending. First, um, first is that the guidelines as approved by our city attorney's office would remain in effect. Um, so the city attorney's office reviewed this entire policy when we brought it to you last October. And we're, we're not planning on changing any of the recommendations that they made. Um, we're recommending that the fees stay the same for all of the fields in Glendale. And um, as I mentioned just a moment ago, youth groups using the fields are allowed to place a banner up on a day-to-day -day basis as long as, they re as long as they remove it at the end of the day. We recommend that they are allowed to place two banners on a daily basis and continue this. Um, it allows them to put up the name of their league, Excuse me. It allows them to put up a, a local sponsor for them. Like sometimes a team is sponsored by a local business. They're not really raising money from it, but their uniforms might be provided by that. So that would allow them to keep that banner up. Um, <clears throat> And in addition, the Glendale Unified School District and the Glendale Community College, who use Stengel Field, should be exempt from that two-banner limit because the school districts under our joint use agreement do use Stengel Field and they put up multiple banners and take them down on a daily basis. Um, we don't anticipate a large fiscal impact. Um, there certainly won't be any impact on us cost-wise to the city. We, we don't really anticipate much revenue to come from this though, uh, just because we don't have a staff person that's available to go out and solicit these banners. Um, we have been collaborating with the youth groups um, per the suggestion from the commission two years ago, I believe, to try and come up with a policy for our citywide fields. This policy was put in place as kind of a pilot program for that um, to see how much revenue we could generate and we haven't generated a lot. Um, but we are looking to possibly expand so that if, if the business comes to us, we have the ability of renting out the space and generating some revenue. Uh, so today we are looking for a recommendation from you on expanding this policy to the outside fields if you feel that it's something that you'd like us to do. I just have two things. One, uh, in, when the teams or leagues come to register, are you giving them a packet of in information and are you including the banner policy in it? We haven't thus far. We will. Um, all of our youth groups do have to register and fill out a, a, an approved community youth group packet. And um, what we'll do if this is approved for those citywide fields is we can include the application for banners, um, sponsorships a, in a it. A flyer or something so they know they can do that. Absolutely. Yes. And then the second thing is for the, the free banners, somewhere in their permission to do that, they should be told that they're not allowed to cover any existing banners. Yes, yes. We will make sure that in their packets when they're um, signing up every season, each youth group is given that if there's existing banners that have been paid for, they won't be allowed to cover them up. Yeah. Okay. I have a question for you. We might not know the answer to this, but the one on Stingle Field, those are some very nice banners and impressive sponsors. Do we have any idea of the revenue that... I know that's not our area. Is this for the Wood Bat League? That didn't yeah. generate any yeah. revenue. Hmm? That didn't generate any revenue. Any revenue? No. They're just they're just Those were the banners that I believe uh, the Wood Bat League manager or owner put up, solicited in his own. He put them up for his season. Yeah. And then they will be coming down, I believe, on the, probably the 25th. Yeah, I was just curious. We wouldn't know how much the manager got for that. As, as no, that I have. There's point whether it's worth looking into, like, having a marketing firm go through the foundation as, as doing it for the foundation and getting a small percentage or, or, or just a, a, a write-off. So, but I didn't know whether it was worth that if it's um, not going to generate that much revenue. 
Yes. Our, our staff was uh, going to gen was going to put some um, staff time into doing some generation once we passed the first one for the skate park and the uh, sports complex. But unfortunately, we were we cut we were cut back, and our staffing is low. Therefore, right. we yeah. kind of lost that opportunity. So we're kind of hoping in the future we might figure out mm -hmm. which way to go and how to do something like similar yeah, to that. Just, just think a little bit outside and I personally, without burdening staff. <laughs> well, I personally see nothing wrong with if the foundation was to get some banners for the, the different fields that we could do a revenue sharing with the parks foundation since the money they raise is going to come back to us anyway. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that we can approve this the way it is, and you, yeah, at some I was time, just throwing some things. No, I think out, that's a great so. idea. You know, you have a lot of dynamic people on the foundation, and um, they can definitely uh, they know people in town, and they might be able to generate might, funds, uh, donate some time. So I think that's something that if you well, wanted to check with. The city attorney's office and see if that was a. I just didn't know whether it was worth it or not. Um, it's scary. It's going like that. Don't so know. Maybe. Don't know. Yeah, you don't know. A, okay. You know, a little bit here, a little bit there. It, and Mr. President, we we just felt that having a policy was was a lot of first, first step. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I agree with what you just said. There. I mean, if we if we this makes sense, mm -hmm. um, and then we'll look into the other. We'll expand. Yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah. yeah, so I think right. it's a start. To at least go with it. Was oh, there a motion? Oh. <laughs> oh, you want to make this one? Oh, okay. um, I I move that we direct staff to expand on the existing banner policy to include all ball fields and multi-purpose fields within the city. Is there a second? I'll second it. All right. And we have roll call, please. Mr. Garpetian, absent. Khan? Yes. Patrick? Yes. Sharkey? Yes. President Rotfogel? Yes. Thank you. Item 6A3, motion to approve the proposed community services and park student art display policy as an extension of the lifelong learning program effective September 1st, 2011. Good afternoon, President Rotfogel, commissioners, public viewing at home staff. My name is Teresa Alexanian, Administrative Analyst for the Community Services and Parks Department. Last month I gave an update for the Commission that we were working on a student art display policy as a extension of the lifelong learning program where um, we would be able to allow students and instructors to display art that they create in the classes that they are taking from um, as part of our lifelong learning program through the department. Well, we have completed the, the, um, the policy and uh, we would like to present it to you for approval uh, effective September 1st. Um, basically, the purpose and mission, and I'll read it exactly off the policy, um, the City of Glendale Community Services and Parks Department is offering display space free of charge for art created by students enrolled in our instructors providing lessons for an art class as part of the lifelong learning program offered through Community Services and Parks. Offering space for art display is a way for the city to integrate and foster public awareness of the arts and culture into the daily life of people in Glendale. Visual art enhances public spaces and invites public participation and interaction. Furthermore, student art displays will encourage public participation in the arts and allow students and instructors to recognize the value of their work and art in general through public appreciation. The department would like to, community services and parks would like to use this opportunity to publicize the classes that are offered through the lifelong learning program and encourage participation in the arts. Um, to go through some of the guidelines and the policy, the who can apply so that the public viewing at home, if they haven't read the policy, will know. It is basically open to all students enrolled in and our instructors providing lessons for an art class through the program within the last 12 months. Acceptable artwork is basically, we're, we're, we're going to try to accommodate um, all mediums. Um, so it will include painting, photography, sculpture, crafts, graphic arts, mosaic, stained glass, on and on and on. Um, the proposal submission timeline, um, basically when the artwork is available for display, that's when the person should apply 
for space, use of space, um, because they will have to include a picture of the artwork with their, uh, with their application. Um, some of the guidelines, the, f the application materials that are required to apply for use of space to display the artwork would be a completed application, which will include a chase, uh, the choice of desired location for where to display the art, a detailed description of the proposed exhibition, including the number of, art, uh, the number of pieces that they would like to display, the art media, the title of the artwork, dimensions, weight, maintenance requirements, display requirements and a picture of the artwork. One correction that I would like to add right now and I realized as I was reviewing this for commission is that the third item which is statement of reason for displaying artwork that should have been removed from the policy so we'd like to make that change now so as you approve it um, it will exclude that statement of reason. Um, we're, we don't want Basically, we don't need them to include why they would like to display because it's open uh, and available for, for anybody that's taking the class. Um, the approval criteria, some of the things that we will use in evaluating whether an artwork will be approved for display at the space will be relevance to the lifelong learning program. Subject um, does not violate the artwork guidelines and is suitable for the intended uh, audiences. The, a lot of these will be displayed or people will have to request a display at the adult recreation center or brand studios and we have uh, children and, and seniors and uh, we rent the rooms out to um, various groups so we, don't, we, we want to make sure it's not going to offend anybody and it's going to be appropriate for all ages and groups. Um, dates of dis previous display, so we don't want the same applicant constantly applying because they have 50 things that they want to display and they submit all at once, so we want to be able to give everybody a chance since we really do have limited space. Uh, appropriateness to the size, whether it's, uh, or to the site, whether it's size, content, safety, um, accessibility, and the ease of installation. We, um, most of it will probably be hanging art but we will have some sculptures and um, those could on, only be displayed on stands or if the artwork has to be on easels we have to see if it's appropriate for this site. Um, if it does, if the artwork does require uh, stands, the department currently does not have stands to provide so the, uh, the applicant will have to provide it, um, would, would have to provide it and then of course when they pick up the artwork they will uh, we will return the stand as well. Um, the, the timeline, they, there will be a agreement that is signed which also releases liability for the department and within that agreement um, the timeline will be specified as to when the art will be hung and when it will be brought down and it should not exceed a month. So if we don't have any other art pieces or no one else is requesting for a piece to go up and we would like to keep or the artist would like to keep their art up, we might be able to extend it, but it's um, not to exceed one month according to the policy. We do have a cancellation um, clause in there, so if for whatever reason, whether it's department or city purposes, if we do need to use the site and we, c or, uh, and we can't display the art, we do have the right with the director's approval to, um, to, to use the site and not display the artwork for whatever emergency reasons that may come up. And of course there's the liability, um, they will, as part of the agreement, the exhibitor, once the artwork is approved by um, the director's designee, will have to sign an agreement which releases the city of liability and that, that's kind of the major difference between this and a department-wide policy which would allow the public and uh, the entire public and not just the students and um, instructors because uh, we're st we still need to work through that and, and the liability and whether the uh, artist can carry insurance. So we will at some point expand it. This is kind of a trial uh, starts and we, since we did offer art and uh, as part of our lifelong learning program we figured we would take baby steps and see how this policy works. So. I'm open to any questions. Um, if you are okay with it or if you would like, if you have any recommendations for revisions or changes or if you feel it's missing something that we may have missed, please let us know. We would be happy to modify it. But if you approve um, in its format, we would like for you to approve it to be effective um, September 1st. 
for instance, did you did you mention the five locations, the five facilities? Where oh, uh, right. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. Um, as part of the policy, there's an exhibit which lists the facilities that are available, and currently we have the Adult Recreation Center, Spar Heights Community Center, Pacific Park Community Center, Maple Park Community Community Center, and Brand Studios. Up until it has to come down for renovation, then it would be back up again. So those are the five facilities that we have available so far because those are mostly the facilities that we have wall space um, or just, uh, and the sculptures can only go at Brand Studios because that's the only place we can accommodate sculptures at this time. And we have also as an exhibit, we have the application for submission and the agreement. So if you have any questions on any any of the exhibits, we'd be happy to answer in our revised. Commissioner Khan. I have a question just about the list of facilities. You mentioned that we have a, a limited amount of space to display the art. Would we consider all of our facilities, like for instance, I'm thinking like Dunsmore, uh, or Jewel Bridges, or some of the, the facilities that we've recently remodeled? We, uh, I, and maybe uh, Joanne can help me, but those, some of those facilities are closed, so they're not open to the public, so you don't have uh, traffic coming in and out un unless they're rented. Like Joe Bridges, it's closed unless someone's renting it. So I don't know if people would be interested in displaying the art when the doors are closed. And I also, I'm not sure if there's any other reason why we would not be able to, Joanne, if you want to. Well, that was the main reason, is that okay. there's just no flow of traffic. And the, the object is uh, let, the art, let the students who are taking the art classes display and be proud of their work, as well as it gives us an opportunity to let people know we have classes and art classes that are very good. And we have good instructors, so it's sort of like somewhat of a marketing position and these facilities have a lot of flow of traffic. Anybody else? I just have a comment. Um, I think this is a great idea. There's There's been a hue and cry for places for the community to display their artwork for a long time and this gives the, the students that are taking classes through the city an opportunity to do that. So I think this is, is a really good first step and if if it works out and we can expand it later, that's fine. And if if uh, we can't, at least we're we're addressing some part of the community that would like to see their artwork displayed. So I think this is a great idea. Thank you. And just to add to that, also we we will be get, giving credit to the instructor and the class that they're taking. So we will have signs that identify that it's you know, what class and the instructor that's teaching the class that the art was created in. So that way it'll be a little bit of advertising for our, our instructors and. Also, for those interested in taking a class, well, that's great. I want to take a class with that instructor. So, I'll know. Just, um, I, of course, think it's a great idea. And I, you covered it very well in the agreement, the approval, the insurance, the cancellation. So, so it's, I like that as long as not just anything can go up. So, I think it's a great idea. What about here at City Hall? That was going to be my comment. <laughs> this is not a parks facility, so we I don't know if we would have the ability to, uh, at least as part of this program, we could look into expanding, um, and I'm not sure, but we ha I, I hadn't even thought of that because I, it wasn't a parks facility, but it I, is a city facility, and at some point the policy will get expanded to all sure. city facilities, but we were just trying to take baby steps and just include our own facilities because of just the logistics of well, who will put it up and who will be able to approve it and so. Yeah, and, and not, just, uh, not just in the foyer downstairs, but I think in, in the other major city buildings, um, I can't imagine why they wouldn't want free art. I know that um, Neighborhood Services puts up posters from their poster contest. Um, so I think that's a great idea. And then the other area that I'd like to see it expanded, if we decide to expand, of course, is uh, GUSD and GCC art classes. As if we don't have something that's going up in September to offer, you know, that space when our classes aren't, our our students aren't displaying anything. My last question is, if somebody has a beautiful piece of art and they want to
put it up and sell it. Are they going to be allowed to do that from this? Mm. The, the current policy will now will not allow sale of the art piece while it's being displayed, but if, if they're interested, um, uh, I guess they would have to contact the artist directly or go through the instructor since the instructor's name will be in the class information will be on there, but there, no sale of artwork is so allowed. So no prices or anything? Nothing, okay. no. And that'll be clear? Yes, it's actually in the, in the policy. policy. It does say no sale of artwork. It, all right. And Mr. President, uh, again, this is student art only and students from our lifelong learning classes. And that's the first step. Um, I'm pretty sure the next step will be to work on a public art display policy for all park facilities. And then the next step after that will be public art displays at any, any city or public facilities. Uh, but this is the first step for us. So. It's a great first step. All right, is there a motion? Okay, I'll make a motion that the commission approve the community services and park student art display policy as an extension of a lifelong learning program, effective September 1st, 2011. As amended. As amended. And is there a second? Second. Okay, could we have roll call, please? Commissioner Garpetian is absent. Commissioner Khan? Yes. Patrick? Yes. Sharkey? Yes. President Rothfold. Yes. What is next? Item 6A4, motion to provide feedback on the potential construction of soccer fields as part of the Adult Recreation Center Phase 2 project. Mr. President, Commissioners, uh, we'd like to introduce Hagab Kasabian, who will make the presentation on the potential of soccer fields at the Adult Recreation Center, Park Improvements. Uh, George, do you want to make some introductory comments? Hi. Well, here's Hago. Uh, <laughs> here's Hago. Well done. But, uh, as you are aware, we've been working uh, to essentially uh, implement the, the, la the second phase of improvements at the ARC project. So, um, uh, this potentially uh, has uh, a lot of impacts to uh, a real busy site in the future. Um, a lot of activity is going to uh, go on there in the future related to just Central Park use, ARC use, the Museum of Neon Art, the actual Brand Passageway, uh, as well as the library. So it's a lot of users uh, and uh, different uses occurring uh, at this site. So uh, with that, uh, let Hagop uh, go through the analysis. Good afternoon, President Ralph Vogel, Commission members, city staff, and uh, viewers. Again, I'm Hagop Kasabian, project manager with the Parks Department. Basically, we are here today to uh, ask you for feedback on the potential of providing soccer fields at the Adult Recreation Center. What you see in front of you on the screen is the plan that was approved back in 2008, I believe, 2008, late uh, 2008. And basically it's what we have there today as an existing site, except if you can follow the, um, the pointer here, the building is, as you see it here, is what's existing. What we're missing here is the actual trash enclosure and the public restrooms, outside public restrooms, which would be at this location. And the site currently is fenced off from this point all the way down. So what we've got in this area that I'm pointing out is just a dirt lot with the exception of the Tai Chi area, which has been turfed, and we do have current reasons at the Tai Chi area. To give you some idea of dimensions of the site, we pretty much have approximately 440 feet going across by about 310 feet. It is a 3.3 acre site. The green area is about 1.8 acres only in this location. Typically soccer fields get to be um, about 300 feet by 220, 240 feet. These are 
some uh, official regulation sizes, and I can give you the sizes exactly based on the, uh, the high school standards. And um, as I go through the slides, you'll see how the soccer fields are laid out and what amount of space they take out, out, of, the, um, out of the site. Just to fall back, on July 5th of this year, we actually took a plan back to council and we did get an approval for a change order to the contractor, which was George Hopkins Construction, to proceed with the second phase of the development of the site. Again, what we've got here is the building, the outbuilding as we call it, which, uh, which has the maintenance, uh, the, the maintenance office and also the public restrooms, the parking lot to the south. And also we do have the walkways, as you see here, the serpentine walkway that leads in from Colorado. The park more or less has been kept as an open space. Basically this is providing us with a template of what could potentially come into the park with other activities that we could include. So this part is very diverse in its use. It could be used currently, it, it is being used as the safety dispersal area in case of an emergency. We also could use it for concerts, for musical events, for um, meetings, uh, any type of an activity. It is more or less an active and passive recreational use. This is the Tai Chi area as I, was, uh, as I had mentioned earlier. Now I'm going to move into the, um, the layouts of soccer fields. What we have here is an 80 by one, 82 by 150 soccer field. This is pretty much half the size of the smallest soccer field that is approved by the um, National Federation of State High School Association. This could be laid out in the north-south direction. We can also flip it and point it in the uh, east and west direction. Pretty much it would take out the same amount of space, obviously. The next layout is the potential of uh, having a, s a couple of seven-on-seven -seven soccer fields at this location as well. Seven-on-seven -seven fields Currently, you could pretty much have a variety of dimensions for seven on seven. You don't really have to follow any particular standards, which could be the same could be said about any soccer field, uh, to be honest. But seven on seven is a little less stringent when it comes to um, youth use and uh, adult use and so forth. That's some of the direction that I've been given. I could be wrong. Seven on seven is fairly new. I don't really, um, I haven't, um, played seven on seven enough, nor have I explored it enough, but I know it's something new that has kind of come into the scene, I would say probably within the last five years, and it's gotten really popular uh, within the last five years. Here's a soccer field, which is the smallest, as I had mentioned earlier, 165 by 300 feet. As you can see, we've laid it out, it pretty much, for lack of a better word, gobbles up most of the, uh, the site. Including the existing building. Including the existing building. <laughs> the, next, uh, the next one is a 200 by 300 soccer field, which obviously getting a little larger. And then when we get to the, uh, the, the next size, which is 220 by 340, and actually there is one size larger than this. It's the 225 by 360, which almost encompasses the whole, the entire site. Again, um, council had asked us to go back and take a look at the potential of adding soccer fields um, to this site. We are here today presenting you with some options and um, basically just would, would love to hear back, uh, give us some feedback on um, how we should proceed and also I'm ready to answer any questions that I haven't really answered either here or in the report. Who owns the piece of land that is vacant on the corner of Colorado and Brand? That is privately owned, and I believe the owners own that property, the Masonic Temples, and the two building next to it. So the owners own that property and moving north all the way up to the building that's owned by the city, which is the gray building that used to be the, uh, the Rite Aid and the great car uh, carpet company buildings. And that's where uh, George had mentioned Mona and the passageway, that's where we're coming through but it is privately owned. It's the DPHRS. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I knew when he said the... Right, uh, has there been a, a groundswell of people wanting a soccer field, or is it just someone who is... is I, I just don't know where this came from. Like, I haven't seen any... 
Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I, I'm Gabrielle Golia, and I can answer that um, at least as far as the youth groups go, we, um, we actually surveyed all of the, the youth sports groups about a year ago um, about the potential of putting in some smaller seven by seven fields or seven on seven player fields um, up at site A, as a matter of fact. And the overwhelming response that we got was that they didn't want to pay money to rent smaller fields like that. Um, they want full-size soccer fields uh, because that's what they use for their games and that's, that's really all that they can pay for. Um, so from a sports standpoint, there hasn't been an overwhelming uh, request for the smaller fields at all. Okay. And how do the seniors feel? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, think I, I just don't know whether this is a... Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, President Rafagel, Commissioners Hagup, if you could go back to Exhibit 2. I, I think the general idea on the part of the City Council is that we are on the verge of improving this green space, which, which is, is, is city property, and we have a plan uh, for a very simple open area without too many improvements or amenities. It's a very minimalist approach. And it's minimalist by design because um, there are a number of different components of projects that are being developed almost at the same time. And I think we wanted to retain some flexibility as it relates to the ARC Phase Two park improvements. Um, at the same time, uh, a couple of council members got the notion that, that maybe this is not an opportunity where we should look at what it might look like if we were able to implant a soccer field in this this new green open space area that we have before us. So they asked us to to uh, to develop some overlays to see what a soccer field might look like, and and then what would be the operational impacts to uh, the adult recreation center, for example, the plans for the library and the passageway and, and the Mona Museum. Um, and what would be the impacts? I think Haga mentioned if a soccer field were to go on that side, it would have to be a fence. So that would kind of uh, chop things up, if, if you will, in terms of an open recreation, recreational area for the seniors. Obviously, it would take away a recreation space that, that was initially designed for the seniors. Um, it would take away recreational space or casual space for uh, uh, the connection to the the Americana and brand and, and having business pers uh, persons come and, and use the space. And I think the library is planning to reorient the in main right. entrance to their building um, out into what, what, what would be the, the, the park, which, which would now then become a soccer field. So we were, we were asked to explore what it might look like with some overlays and to get feedback from the commissioners in terms of operational, how, operationally how they felt that would impact the Adult Recreation Center project in particular. Commissioner Patrick? Um, I certainly appreciate the, the growing popularity of soccer and I appreciate the, the need for soccer fields in the city, but I don't feel that, that Central Park is the place to put the soccer fields. I, I think the first thing, it's very clear that we don't have enough space there to do a full-size soccer field without tearing down the building, and I don't think that's going to be happening. Um, I think that this is not the right venue for soccer fields or a soccer field. We have a building that's an adult recreation center that is used primarily by seniors. We have another building, the, the central library, that's used very much by seniors and by children. Putting a soccer fields in this particular park would bring in tons more parking problems, tons more people wanting to, to park and, and be in that park, and it would take away the usability of the park for the patrons that are already there from the Adult Recreation Center and from the, the Central Library. Um, I think that, that what, what this, it appears to me that what the city was trying to do with this site is kind of bring it together with with the library and, and parks working together and having a site where they could do programs together where perhaps we could do outdoor story hours in, in the park where, where there could be some synergy between the two departments and between everything that's happening in that particular bar block of Brand Boulevard, not only in the park with the library and the Adult Recreation Center. 
and this would put an entirely different kind of activity in this park and it just doesn't seem to me that this is the the right place to have a a soccer field and i think it would it um it would be a problem when 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 the passageway is put in and when the library reorients itself and then people aren't walking out into a park where they can sit and read their books, where they can uh, come out of the Adult Recreation Center to enjoy the outdoors, it would be a soccer field. And so I, I, I know we need more soccer fields, but we also need more green space where people in Glendale can, can have a more passive outdoor environment. And so I just think that that's that's what's happening with Central Park, and it's a, a wonderful design, and it's going to be a wonderful open space, and, and it needs to be an open space, not not an active like a soccer or a baseball or a softball or any any of that kind of space. Have the diversity. Yeah. For a lot of things to happen there. I couldn't have said it better, and I think that the one note I wrote myself was the word noise, and it would create so much noise and it would totally change everything at the ARC that's beautiful about it right now. You couldn't sit out in that patio because of the noise. You couldn't use any of the outside areas because of what I, what I see as the noise problem. And I think it's a great idea to get more soccer fields in Glendale. That's the ARC is not the place. And we'll save $850,000. <laughs> is that it. what it said in here? Approximately. Possibly. I, okay. I agree with most of what you're saying. Uh oh, here it comes. Uh -huh. <laughs> here it comes. No, I do. I, I think you guys raise very good points, and I, I, at the end, I agree with everything you just said in terms of this. To me, it looked like really a few things. First of all, there's not the space. I think if there was more space, I think that the conversation would be different. Um, I, I think the problems that a lot of the other, I, I'm thinking maybe of Columbus is having a problem with the soccer fields there because of the adjacency of the residential. Well, this, this does not have that, so, which is a nice thing. Um, so I could see where that would be thrown out there and said, possibly to look at that. The other thing is I don't, I don't know anything about seven-on-seven seven soccer, but so far what we've heard, it seems like that it's not a huge demand or people don't really want to pay to use that small of a field. So once again, it goes back to the size issue. Um, I, I, do, I do agree for the most part as it relates to this setting, being near the library, being in conjunction with the other uses, but I'm also sensitive to the fact that uh, it would be nice to activate that park. Uh, for quite some time now, we had some of the homeless people camping out or sitting out in this space. So it isn't as if uh, some activity out there certainly wouldn't hurt the park. Maybe it's not this, maybe it's something else. Um, but once again, I, I agree in general with what was brought up in terms of the consensus with my colleagues. I don't think that the soccer fields will necessarily work here, but mainly I agree with some of the programming, but primarily from the space perspective. Any other comments? Okay. Um, so there needs to be a motion. Um, Commissioner Patrick. Let's see. We, we did provide some feedback, so I guess I would move that um, the Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Commission um, has given you some, some feedback in general. Um, we don't think this is the proper venue for soccer fields uh, at this time. So I move that. Does that work? <laughs> Works. Works. <laughs> I'll second it. Commissioner Skarpetian, absent. Khan? Yes. Patrick? Yes. Sharkey? Yes. President Rotfogel? Yes. Thank you. Item 6A5, motion to provide feedback on the potential renaming of ARC Central Park to Memorial Park.
Good afternoon, Teresa Alexanian, Administrative Analyst for the Community Services and Parks Commission. I'm back. Um, on July 19th, at the council meeting, council directed staff to agendize renaming of Central Park to Veterans Memorial Park, possibly. And staff would like to present that to the commission for feedback to take back to council. Um, the current area as a whole, Central Park, encompasses the library, adult recreation center, and the grass area, which will be developed into a park um, as part of the ARC Phase 2 project, as uh, Hagob just presented. Um, a little bit of history. The library department was kind enough to give us a little bit of history on um, how Central Park, the, na the naming of Central Park came about, because I don't know that we have it in our official documents or records as Central Park, but um, that area, which now encompasses the Adult Recreation Center, the library, and, and the grass area, from 1908 to 1937 was occupied by Glendale Union High School and Glendale Community College. And in 1938, the city purchased the property and demolished the buildings because um, they were condemned because of uh, earthquake of earthquake safety, and uh, at that time the city built a um, constructed tennis courts, softball softball fields occupying half of the property, and flower shrubs, lawn, and trees in the second half of of that property. The first available reference to Central Park was in a Los Angeles Times article from November of 1945 referencing um, a parade down Brand Boulevard and also in other LA Times articles referencing uh, parades and, and gatherings that took place um, in that area. In um, 1949, the first ARC Adult Recreation Center was opened and in the early 70s, the library was constructed. So that's a little bit of history on how, um, how the area came about and how it's referred to as Central Park. So it's referred back to it in L in a, in LA Times article going back to 1945. Uh, the cur currently, the adult recreation fa phase two project, which is a completion of the remaining one and a half acre park improvement, including lighting, irrigation, planting, and ADA accessibility improvements. Um, as just mentioned earlier, it's a minimalistic design so that it could flow with the passageway and the future library improvement project. And so the, the library improvements at, at the Central Library will include reorientation of the library entrance to Harvard Street and adding a second entrance facing ARC and the park. The Central Park Passageway includes a creation of pedestrian passageway connecting Brand Boulevard with Central Park, the ARC, and the library. And then, of course, the MONA, which is the Museum of Neon Art, which will be relocating to Brand. So the passageway is supposed to open up that area into Brand and the Americana. Uh, we would like to ask um, Commission for feedback, and, and Council would like would ask staff to explore the potential of uh, renaming and some of the things to keep in mind in, um, in deciding whether it would be a good idea or a bad idea or something to consider at a later time would be in, in determining whether renaming of Central Park to Veterans Memorial Park would be a good idea is whether it fits with the existing projects which, was, which would be the Adult Recreation Center, the library, the passageway and into Brand. Uh, also, duplicating efforts, we do have a veterans memorial out in front uh, on Isabel and Broadway at City Hall, and the Chamber of Commerce uh, Patriotism Committee is in charge of that specific um, this, uh, monument outside, and they hold events annually uh, on Memorial Day. There's also um, the forget what it's exactly called, the Vietnam War Memorial in Montrose, and that's specific for uh, the Vietnam War, but we also have that monument over there. The, the next thing to keep in mind is whether adding a, this, um, renaming it to Veterans Memorial Park would mean adding a display, which would mean a monument which is currently not budgeted, so that's another possibility and something to keep in mind. And also other potential uses, 
Um, the site is currently being um, considered for uh, a display to honor Glendale's sister cities, um, one of the areas outside of uh, the Adult Recreation Center. Um, it's not definite. Uh, there, there hasn't been a definite decision made on that, but city manager's office is currently working with a committee, and they've identified potentially that area for a sister city display. And we have se uh, seven sister cities currently with um, Armenia, Japan, Korea, and Mexico. We do have a the department, Community Services and Parks, does have a park naming policy which dates back to September of 1988. And the policy basically states that um, with recommendation from the commission, the Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Commission, that um, we would go to city council for approval. And basically the the uh, categories are a name which has recognized geographic, topographic, historical, or botanical significance. The second one is name which honors an individual who has made a significant contribution to the city, state, or nation. Named after individual or families who have donated property for the development of a park. And lastly, the selection process may include where deemed appropriate a contest or competition if it is felt that such an alternative would promote great community-wide interest and participation. So these are sort of the guidelines that um, have been used in, in naming the parks in the past. And I guess this is the guidelines um, commission could keep in mind in um, providing feedback whether you feel the renaming of Central Park to Veterans Memorial Park would be something the City Council or the Department should consider. Um, some, some recommendations Commission um, could make are to change the name from Central Park to Veterans Memorial Park, to um, not change the name if you don't think it's a good idea, or to consider changing the name when the other projects like the Central Library improvements or the passageway projects, when those projects are finalized and the plans are finalized, and if you feel that maybe as a whole it would make sense. Um, so these are s some of the things to keep in mind, and we're open to taking, um, to taking your feedback back to uh, City Council on how you feel about the renaming. Okay. Commissioner Sharkey? I feel it's premature. I think it's too early. We're starting off uh, with all kinds. We're half developed over there. So I'd, I'd prefer waiting with all due respect to veterans. But uh, I, I'd really like to, to wait. And again, my question is, has there been an overwhelming <laughs> uh, people asking for this? Uh, that would be. Is this just a few people have suggested this, or? But it, basically, I think it's premature. So, council. Uh, I guess there has been a request of council, mm -hmm. um, so city council asked staff to look into it. Oh, okay. So there was something at orals or something. Yeah, maybe one person at oral or two. Yes. Or, so. uh, President Rafagel, commissioners. I, I, again, I think just generally speaking, there. In this country, there seems to be a swell of wanting to do more to recognize and honor our veterans. I know at the federal level, with a lot of our federal programs, for example, under Housing and Urban Development Department of Labor, they're asking us to emphasize services to, to veterans and make special allowances uh, for veterans. And yeah, we are beginning to get a lot more requests from uh, veteran organizations on on different ways that we can uh, recognize and, and honor uh, veterans. And so I think it's part of that of that swell, and and again, um, since we're in the process of developing this new uh, park, um, that maybe this is a good time to explore the possibility of changing the, the name of the park uh, again to honor uh, veterans as uh, to, and to change the name to Veterans Memorial Park. Um, so that's I, I think just generally that's how this whole thing emanates. Uh -huh. In terms of my feedback on it, uh, the uh, I, it, it really wasn't called Central Park to begin with, correct? It's just kind of name evolved. Is that the way we understand it? Well, from our research, it has been referred to as Central Park, but I mean, I personally, I wasn't able to 
find a document of naming the park to Central Park, but I can't say that it hasn't been. So, yeah. but that is the reason that it's Central Library. Is because of because it was built in Central Park. Oh, okay. <laughs> Even though it wasn't. That's good to know. They did you, refer to it in the 1945 yeah. article as Central Park, so um, I don't know if it was just one of those names that came about from when the project was started and it just stuck, or if, it, if there was right. an actual form, formal naming that I can't. Right. Or the author of the article needed to have a name for the park and Could called it Central Park. Central Park. Yeah, I actually, I actually like the concept or I like the idea of changing the name to, to the Veterans Memorial Park. I think as, as our, uh, I want to call him chairman, but he's not, he's our director, mentioned in terms of honoring the veterans, I think whether you have a memorial up in Montrose or whether there's other areas or there's banners that we put up around the city, obviously we're doing that for a reason. And if this is a way or a nod for us to be able to do that further, I, I would encourage that. I would be all for that. So I would be very much in favor of supporting this name change. Um, I have a, a couple of, of concerns. Um, the, I, I do agree that it's, it's wonderful to honor the veterans, and I think that, that we have, have done quite a bit of that in the city. I'm a little concerned about this um, memorial that's out here. Uh, I think that the Chamber and other veterans groups have put a lot of time and effort into that particular memorial, and it, it seems kind of strange to have the memorial with the names here and yet we have a Veterans Memorial Park about five, six blocks away. So I'm not sure whether naming a whole bunch of different places and doing memorials at a whole bunch of different places takes away from the fact that we have this, these two memorials already. And I don't really know the answer to that question, but it's, it's just a question that I have. Does that sort of diffuse what we're trying to do by doing it in too many places. And then I, I, I do have, I don't think Central Park is an exactly exciting name, but on the other hand, it, it is, in, in most cities, libraries are called main libraries, and ours is called Central because it's in, in that park. So I have a little bit of concern with that. And so I guess I agree with Commissioner Sharkey that it's, it's just, I, I'm, I'm not willing to say I'm opposed to it, but on the other hand, I just think it's too early to be making a decision. I, I think there's some other folks we need to, to talk to and get input from before we decide we're going to recommend that kind of a change. Yeah, I, I think that if we decided to change it to Veterans Memorial or whatever, that we could m probably move obviously at a cost, but move the memorial from here to there. I would actually think that a more encompassing, possibly a more encompassing name would just be Memorial Park, not Veterans Memorial Park, only because you could have other types of displays there. For instance, the city, sister cities uh, displays would fit in a memorial park more than they would in a veterans memorial park. So that um, I'm not opposed to veterans memorial park. As a matter of fact, when I grew up in Culver City, that's the park we went to. We went to veterans memorial park. So um, there's a lot of them around, but I I think that you know maybe having a naming contest or just looking at simplifying the name to strictly Memorial Park, I think would personally, I would like that better. Okay, so would it be fair to say that Commission feels now that we should revisit this later when um, the other projects have come to fruition or re revisit it or maybe Jess can help? <laughs> help us, Jess? Because I feel... <laughs> What I heard is that we have two commissioners that feel that it might be a little early to be changing the name and maybe we need two to... Two and a half. 
<laughs> have, maybe we need to get further along with some of the other projects and flesh this out a little bit more, uh, maybe get feedback from some uh, additional groups or commissions. And one and a half or one commissioner <laughs> that, that feels that um, uh, there might be some merit to changing the name of the park to, to a Veterans Memorial Park and a half a commissioner <laughs> that feels that uh, maybe as, as part of the name change that we could relocate the memorial from City Hall to a new memorial park and maybe keep it a little bit more generic as memorial so that we can honor and, and uh, include monuments for other memorial type purposes such as a sister city memorial and so it could be more things to more people and still be able to honor and memorialize our veterans at the same time. Well, he listens. And so that <laughs> So that would be the feedback that I, I would include in, in the report to City Council, and and then City Council could take it from there. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. That's why he's director. <laughs> you should be and director. Did, Do we need a motion for that? Yes. <laughs> oh, gee. Commissioner oh, Patrick. Uh, can I just say so moved? Yes. Oh, yes. For that nice um, yes. summary that Jess did for us. I'll second it. Okay, let's have a roll call. Commissioner Scarpetin, absent, Khan. This is for what, this summarizes Jess's comments. Correct, that would okay. be the feedback. Yes, that's correct. Patrick? Yes. Tarkey? Yes. President Rockpool? Yes. Item, yes. item 6B, reports for information only, 6B1, Grand Park Gates. Uh, we have... Um, Laila Batar, our, our project manager, um, to give you an update on the uh, status of the Grand Park Gate project. Good afternoon, President, members of the Commission, Laila Batar. Uh, a couple of years ago, there were some incidents at uh, Grand Park which uh, raised some concern by the adjacent neighbors. They came to the city and the city conducted a workshop and to address security in the park and, and one of the items that came out of that workshop is installing gates at Brand Park to prevent uh, cars from entering after hours. Uh, okay. uh, I'm starting the presentation with some flashbacks showing you a little bit of what Brand Park was. Uh, this is the original gates to Brand Park, uh, which was taken down in 1913. It was built around 1904. Uh, this is the gateway that we have right now that was uh, constructed in 1913, and the fencing as well. This is uh, how uh, Brand Park used to look in the 1920s. And you see the, the gate and the direct access to, to the uh, Brand Mansion or the castle, as they used to call it. And you also see the orange groves in the park. This is the existing condition of, of the gates. What we're doing is we're going to install gates at the east entry of the park and also a gate at the west entry of the park. Uh, at the east entry of the park, the gates will be recessed in to give hierarchy to the, to the historical gates. Uh, they will be swing gates, and we, they will, uh, uh, again, open at uh, opening hours of the park, be it, is it 7 a.m., Gary, the hours when the park opens? You open it at 6.30 or 6 o'clock to, we'll have to probably now open it at 6 o'clock. Okay, uh, that's the time when the gates will be open and I believe they will be closing at 10 o'clock when the park is closed. On the, if you look at the west gates, if I can do this, this area, we will have also a rolling gate that will close that end of the park. We also, uh, Public Work will do some improvement in that area. They will improve the uh, handicap access, the accessible ramp in here. They'll add that and also add some accessible ramps here and also here. This is an overlay of the new design on the existing condition. 
we took the design to the historic commission and uh, the commission uh, felt that what we tried to do is we tried to take the height of the existing gates and we some of the design elements without uh, copying too much that, because that's where the line is drawn is how much you take from historic and be kind of compatible but not mimic it completely. The Historic Commission recommended that we add more elements to the gate to make it more compatible with the existing historic gate. So we did. We added more elliptical uh, elements and circles to, to match them. Uh, in general, this gate will be about four feet nine inches high, so they're not high gates. And that kind of works with also the fences. The fence, existing fence is not that high either. We'll also have some fencing on the side to tie the gates into the existing columns. This is the west gate, which is the rolling gate. Let's give you an idea, section at the west gate. Well, you see the height of the fence, the gate is the same height. That's it. And uh, I'm sorry. You mentioned that the Historic Preservation Commission wanted you to add some more to the gates. You didn't do that yet, or was that? No, we did. Oh, we you did. did do it's that. kind of yeah. Maybe it's a little hard to see, but we had just circles at the squares at the end. But they asked us to add more circles, so we did add some in the center. Let me show you. Right here we added more, and then we added elliptical elements in here. So we added these elements, and, I, and here also we added circles. And I took the drawings and reviewed them with Jay Platt, and he thought we really meant the intention. Can you oh. go back to the, the picture that has the gates all the way across? That's got the, the gates? The plan view? Yeah, this one. Oh, this one, yeah. Let me just go back one more here. Let's see if I could go back to the... Hmm. Oops, sorry. Okay. Uh, what we did is, again, it's hard with these gates. They're a little dark, but it's hard to see them. I'm sorry. But we kind of lined up with the top of the gate here mm -hmm. without going all the way top to the top of it. We lined up with the structure of these gates, and that's how we carried the height of the new gates and the fencing as well. And on the west gates that are rolling, those will have uh, electric eyes so that people can't, you know, there can't be an accident or anything? Well, these are manually closed gates, so the staff will come at okay. 10 p.m. close the gates, yeah, after the park is closed. You'll be doing that personally, Gary? Of course. Yeah, and, and of course access will be given to library staff, you know, keys and, and certain things because we have a lot of departments that go into that park. So we have GWP, Public Works, and so on. We're looking also at uh, restoring the existing gates as well. They're in bad shape, the historic gates themselves. And also we're looking at restoring these uh, elements, the gateway elements as well, patching and painting and that kind of thing. And how much is all this costing us? We're looking at it right now in terms of cost. We haven't gotten to the development of the cost and the drawings to that level. We're just doing the conceptual right now. Great. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you very much. Great report. What is next? Item 6B2, Leisure Guide Update. I'd like to introduce Ross Ferris. He's the community service manager. He's in charge of our new media team. Um, be, as you know, we've lost Karen Fries, who did an enormous amount of work with all the, our different media that we work with. So Ross is in charge of our new team. He's here to talk to you about it. President Rob Fogel, commissioners, the city staff, and viewers. Uh, recently, we've had uh, several budget changes We've had a reorganization of uh, personnel because of retirements and uh, budget uh, considerations. And the city has also uh, adopted a policy of uh, less printed materials, printed media. And also, uh, former Commissioner Bennett 
uh, always uh, promoted uh, doing more uh, online, and uh, we're moving uh, kind of toward all those things with our new media committee that's been in existence uh, just about two months. And what we're doing is taking the leisure guide, uh, the old uh, the city views, and a number of other uh, programs the city had to promote the, the department and the recreation area, and uh, moving toward uh, going online, uh, using the internet, and uh, re, uh, reformatting them um, so that we can reach uh, at least as many, if not more, people uh, than we have previously. But uh, it's saving money, uh, trying to save money, and uh, adopting the city's policy of less printed material. We we have a several short presentations today. Um, some of our media committee members are here, the key people. Uh, Norma Valle is going to come up and talk a little bit about the leisure guide. Uh, Seva uh, Garabedian is going to come up and discuss the newsletter and what we're doing on the, the websites. And uh, we're going to, to move ahead with this. Uh, we have sp spent actually a great deal of time in the last two months to reformat this to get ready for the fall and winter seasons um, with our community classes, our contract classes, and our activities. And as we go forth, we're going to refine this uh, uh, and make it even better. And I'll, uh, I'll have Norma Valle come up, and she'll lead off with a little, uh, little talk about what we're doing with the Leisure Guide. Thanks, Russ. Good afternoon, President Rothfogel and members of the Commission and Park Department, Department staff. Uh, my name is Norma Valles. I'm Community Services Coordinator at Pacific Community Center. I'm happy to be part of the newly formed media team for our department. I'm responsible for the Leisure Guide. The fall issue was our first attempt at designing the Leisure Guide. In the past, the Graphics Department has done it for us. So I wanted to take a minute to go over a few changes for the fall issue. First of all, we no longer mail the Leisure Guide, so in order to notify the community, we sent, sent 10,000 postcards out to the community that were uh, mailed out on August 8th to inform the community to go to the website to download the latest fall issue of the Leisure Guide. To assist with the transition from print to online only, we did have some limited Xerox copies available, or we will have some limited Xerox copies available at the following locations. It's going to look like this. The color version of it is here, so if you decide to print it out at home, it's in a nice color format. Uh, the four community centers, Pacific Park Community Center, Maple Park Community Center, Adult Recreation Center, Spar Heights, Brand Studios, and the Sports Complex, as well as City Hall Parks Office will be uh, locations where you can pick up the Leisure Guide. An email address is also created so patrons can email so they can be added to the mailing list. Upon customer request or quarterly, we will send out an email to those who are on the list with a link to the current Leisure Guide. The email address is cspleisureguide at ci.glendale.ca.us. A few things that you want to notice in regards to the new Leisure Guide is if you get a chance to open it up, one of the first things you'll notice is that we've gone to color. We've added color since now we are no longer printing it. Uh, color will no longer be an, an issue in regards to expense. So we decided to add some color to make it a little bit more eye-catching and appealing for our customers. Secondly, you'll notice on the left side, we added bookmarks to make the document easier to navigate. These bookmarks are labeled by areas of interest, so you can skip around without needing to scroll through the entire document. And lastly, when you're on the facilities page, a new component is once you click on the address, 
I'm sorry. Whatever. Oh, up high. There. It will take you straight to a Google Maps page showing the location of the park or facility. We would like to continue to enhance the leisure guide so, that so your feedback is valued. Please contact us with your suggestions. Thank you. And now Seva will come up and discuss some of the issues that we've had or some of the new changes that we have coming up regarding our newsletter, Twitter, and the City Connection. President Ralph Fogel, Commissioners, before uh, Salva gets started, I just want to say uh, we've been talking about first steps in a lot of the reports we've given today. This to me is a big step, and we've really, we've really made a, a, a huge step with, with a, uh, a, a totally electronic leisure guide, and I'm very happy and very proud of the staff. They've worked really hard on this, and I mean, they've enhanced it so much as you were able to see. So I, I just needed to get that out. Okay. You have right to be. You're right to be proud. It's great. And I just want to say, I love those bookmarks down down the edge. Yeah, that smart. is fabulous. That's such an easy way to get around in a document like that. It looks beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Here's <Seth Buck. laughs> Good afternoon, President Rofogel, Commissioners, fellow city staff. So. Um, my responsibility on the media committee is primarily going to be the website and being the, the contact person uh, within our department and uh, IS for website changes. Um, responsible for micro, uh, micro websites, excuse me, to develop uh, some of the micro websites such as the Civic Auditorium. It needs its own micro website in order for people to be able to access the civic information and rentals. Um, also, um, with regards to the websites, the e-newsletter, for, for the time being, I'm uh, kind of working behind the scenes and trying to format the newsletter that, uh, that is being sent out to our subscribers. So the e-newsletter, actually the first version of it came out today and it was emailed uh, at noon today. It went out to about 2,985 subscribers, email addresses that we had in Rekwar Safari. Um, whoever has been signing up for classes over the past years whose email addresses we had, it went out to them primarily. Um, as Norma mentioned, on the website there is a, a join our mailing list so you could subscribe for the newsletter from there. And we hoped that it continues building. Now the newsletter itself is uh, managed by eye contact, uh, so we have able to add or remove names as we see fit, um, and eye contact uh, users can manage the, the newsletter subscription themselves, so if they want to opt out, um, they can do so themselves. But the newsletter is basically there to inform people um, when the leisure guide goes on, so when winter leisure guides available online, a newsletter will be sent out for that. New classes or upcoming uh, new classes for the upcoming season, upcoming department events, uh, recent news such as uh, recent grand openings that have taken place. Uh, we had Pacific Pool, uh, we had Windsor Manor, or sorry, uh, uh, Griffith Manor, and um, Maple Park Community Center. All of that would be newsletter worthy items that we could include in there. Um, and then the last section is we want to highlight one aspect of our department. Um, in the August one, we started with GYA. And every single time we send out a newsletter, we want to be able to inform uh, our, our uh, department users what else, that we, that, what, what else we offer within our department that they might not necessarily be aware of. The Leisure Guide only covers lifelong learning classes and some of the programs, their services that we offer to the community, uh, inform them about those services and bring more people to our centers. Uh, and this is a sample of the newsletter. Uh, it's, it's, we try to keep it very simple, very fresh. Uh, and and the, the nice part about the, the, the newsletter so far is almost everything is clickable, it's interactable. Uh, when you click on the leisure guide, for example, um, it'll take you to the home page. When, it, when you're highlighting a specific class, it'll take you to that page in the leisure guide. Um, and obviously keep in touch with Twitter, we'll discuss that, and our email address down below. And moving on to Twitter, Twitter is, uh, the way we're looking, our committee is looking at Twitter is it's a, a way to target our mobile audience. Right now uh, the city's website and the department's website isn't very mobile friendly, and we need to contact our customers at a moment's notice for rain closures or anything along those lines. So Twitter is one way we're going to be able to reach out to these customers, have them sign up to the Twitter account. Again, they could manage it. If they want the information, they could apply for it. If they don't want it, they could stop it whenever they feel. 
and Twitter will be able to help us in announcing whatever that's going on. If it's um, an event or if it's a closure or if there's if uh, the, the sports complex, for example, is going to be closed due to rain out or whatever, Twitter is going to help us. And we have two Twitter accounts, one for the department and department events, and we're starting one for the skate park because the skate park clientele um, is very focused and we want to keep you know, Twitter as focused as possible for the user, user itself. And then the last thing we're looking into is push technology in form of uh, text messaging. In, instead of sending out a newsletter, having them come back to our website, giving out the information in form of a text message, it goes, it's there, it's in their hands, and we don't have to do anything with it. And not for marketing purposes, just for informational purposes, again, such as, uh, as, as I said, closures or anything like that in emergency situations where we need to get to the customers and cut through all the traffic. And the next thing is City Connection. City Connection is a citywide newsletter that's going out via email on a monthly basis. Um, the CSP uh, leisure, uh, the newsletter that we're sending out within our department focuses on CSP customers. The City Connection is for city uh, community members uh, abroad. And most of the information could be duplicated except uh, the newsletter that we're preparing for our department is specifically focused towards community services and parks. Um, John Moraga is in charge of getting all the information for City Connection, and he's doing a really good job staying on top of things and providing everything to uh, the PIO. Um, and in there, we can list major department events, upcoming uh, activities, and it's, it's a matter of what city connection, how much material they could put in there. Some stuff might be cut. If they're needing more material, they could put more of whatever information they're provided. At least um, there is some sort of camaraderie, there's an interaction, and from city connection, we, we're exposed to a different market base that we might not, not necessarily get from the CSP uh, uh, newsletter that we currently have. And that pretty much sums it up in terms of where we are, Leisure Guide going online, how we're trying to keep uh, customers coming to the Leisure Guide. Um, as Norma mentioned, any and all feedback, we're, we're, we welcome it, we want to hear it, we want to be able to improve it. Most of us are you know, salivating at the opportunity to get this going and get it to where we want it to be because we interact with a lot of different websites, a lot of different city websites, and we want ours to be just as good, if not better. That's it. Thank you. Looking great. I'm very impressed. You've come a long way in a short time. Oh, great job. Any questions? No. Okay. Great job. Thank, Thank you. you all very much. Item 6B3, monthly activity reports at A, CDBG homeless programs. Oh, good afternoon, President Rafogo, and members of the uh, Parks Commission and staff. Um, my name is Moises Carrillo. I'm the Senior Community um, Supervisor for the uh, Community Service and Parks Department under the CDBG program. Uh, if you remember, about a year ago, we came to the Commission to report on our five-year consolidated plan, and that was a plan to develop community development housing programs. And in that plan, we discussed some of the um, strategies we do for getting public input. And um, I'm going to give you a very summary of a summary, because I know we're running really late on time and appreciate your patience with us. But just to give you an idea of what we're, what we're doing this year, we uh, included in our staff report a program planning calendar, which talked about, which described the, um, the activities we're doing to get community input into our, not only our block grant programs, but our housing programs for the city and our homeless programs. And in that strategy, you'll see a number of activities, uh, one of them being the cruise night, which we were able to um, get public information for uh, about 187 residents directly with uh, surveys and getting their, in, um, their input on that um, uh, survey so that we get an idea of what the needs are. Um, some of the other um, activities we're going to do, and certainly we welcome the commission to participate in these activities since they're open to the public, and it's a good idea to get how, um, how the community thinks about the uh, priorities and what are the needs of, the, um, of their neighborhoods, is the community needs public hearing. And that's proposed for September 15th um, at Mann Elementary School. We're still confirming that date and that time and that location. But it's an opportunity for residents to come and in certain focus group meetings, 
um, provide the input in different groups and different languages for what are the needs of the community. And by and large, we know that a lot of the needs are for youth, parks, recreation. So that seems to be always a priority for us, as well as the, the other uh, service programs, such as seniors and homeless. So it's really a good idea to get um, feedback from the, um, from the residents, but also from not only our CDBG Advisory Committee, but certainly from the Commission to get an idea of what the residents are actually saying versus staff reporting out what are the, the needs. So that is certainly an important um, part of our process. The second part is a very important um, element this year, which we're barely getting data on, and that's the 2010 census. And it just came out that the census is now available in the, in the census track level for Glendale. There's certain um, population data that is available now on, this, on the track level, which certainly will show a change in Glendale. And I've looked at it briefly, and I've noticed some population changes and some demographic changes. So certainly it will be important for us to get that out to the um, the commission as well to look at what's been changing in the um, in the community, and we hopefully it will be um, certainly that is very positive. But we know that uh, certain areas are certainly um, uh, are, are developing into different income levels and different housing populations. So we'll get feedback on that very soon. The other part is a um, survey that we do online, and that will be up very shortly. It's a community needs survey that's web-based, and you're able to actually input data on your needs on, on the web without having to get a written survey, without having to call or come into meetings. So now it's, um, just as the previous staff mentioned, it's getting a little bit more high-tech. We're able to do it online and provide feedback as well. Um, all of this is part of the annual plan to develop a priority and a strategy for all of our CDBG homeless and um, housing programs. And this will be presented to the council in the fall of this year. Um, some of the priorities will be used for the CDBG RFP, which goes out every year in the fall. And that's developed by the CDBG Advisory Committee. Recommendations are made by the CDBG Advisory Committee. Uh, we do um, give a report to the Parks Commission so that the Parks Commission gets an idea of what proposals have come in and what proposals are being funded, including a variety of park projects and CIP projects. Um, so after that review by the committee, it's a, um, a report that's submitted to the council, and the council will get a um, approval of the recommendations by the CDBG Advisory Committee. All this happens within about six months from now. And again, staff is, is working on a uh, finalizing the needs assessment, getting the surveys out, getting the meetings um, out for the community residents to participate in. We certainly encourage the commission and, of course, staff to participate and all our agencies and residents to come out and let their um, concerns and, and voices be heard so that we get a better idea of what the upcoming needs are so that we can better plan and utilize our, our was very, very tight um, federal funding this year for 2012-2013. For so. Uh, with that in mind, um, I will um, end this and see if there's any questions regarding the uh, program pl planning process for next year. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thanks. What is next? Item 6B, 3B, Park Services. Resident Rothfeld, Commissioners, my name is Gary Morello. I'm the Park Services Administrator. i um, be very brief. You have the report in front of you, but uh, the two main items that the Park Services was involved with this uh, last month was uh, the first two weeks of the month we worked on single field, getting it ready for the uh, ESPN filming of the uh, All-Star Game. And the next three weeks of the month, we worked on cruise night. To, you know, set it up, tear it down, and put it all back together again so it looks nobody knows the difference happened on Brand Boulevard. But those are the two main ideas or two main issues that we worked on for the entire month. Other stuff you have, uh, you have in your packet. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, questions? Great report. Item 63C Recreation and Community Services. The report is in front of you. Uh, the Teen Equinox event, uh, they're, they're held three times a year. Uh, this is the last report that we will report on that because that is one of the programs that were in, was involved in the budget cuts. So we're happy to say we ended on a high note. We have a lot of teams involved in 
activities and events in Glendale and it will be missed. That's the end. Unless you have any questions. No. Nope. Nope. Too bad. It's a shame. Maybe Colin is coming. What is next? Item 6B3D CIP projects. <clears throat> President Raffalville and Commissioners, uh, George Baltarius, Senior Project Manager. Um, we have submitted the uh, uh, monthly report. If there are any questions related to that, be glad to answer that. Um, of particular noteworthiness are a lot of the uh, items related to trails and open space, which uh, the volunteers are currently working on at uh, Wilderness Park. So that's an ongoing activity and uh, very uh, enjoyable to work with a lot of the folks that are uh, helping us out up there. Uh, the um, uh, items related to trails and so on, the uh, Glendale, uh, the uh, uh, River Trail Project, uh, River Walk, is uh, continuing to make progress. And uh, you have a chance to possibly stop out there at, along the river uh, near, near the uh, Betty Davis Park. You'll see that the uh, progress is being made. Uh, the Northeast Trees is uh, working diligently to um, execute that project under the direction of John Pearson. So uh, those are some of the highlights, uh, and uh, that's all I have for you right now. I have a quick question. The uh, Columbus Elementary School, the joint use project, yes. is that still moving forward, or what's the status of that? The status of that is uh, um, we, are, we were progressing with the uh, environmental impact report to address that. Uh, however, we have uh, recently come to conclusion on that. Uh, I believe, uh, Jess, if you wish to discuss your meeting with the school district. It's Commissioner Ruffogel. Commissioners, we will be preparing a report to the City Council in about three or four weeks to uh, review the status of all, all four of our joint uh, city school projects, including the Columbus soccer fields. Um, the next step was to make a report to the Environmental Planning Board to review and approve the final EIR, um, which would be another op opportunity for community input. Uh, but part of our re report in three or four weeks to the City Council will um, address whether we, we, we continue with that uh, meeting and the environmental or if, for lack of a better term, we take a time out. One of the other issues besides the, the um, ar arguments for and against that project is, is the funding. As you may or may not know, it is 100 percent redevelopment funded, and so th there's also a question as to whether, whether that funding will continue to be available or not. So that would be another reason why the council and the school district might jointly agree to put it on hold for the time being. We'll have a report in three or four weeks to the council, and we'll talk about it in much more detail. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? I believe the next thing is adjournment. That's correct. Item 7, adjournment. We are adjourned.